Yeah. Patrick Beverly and, and Russell Westbrook. Old friends reunited once again. They got to be happy that they're not having to be roommates, right? The way it used to be when back in the day in the NBA when there were roommates on yeah. the road. You had to, you had to uh, split the, the room. You had to say, this side of my room is my room. Put the tape Two down. Two single beds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's funny because this ha- this goes one of two ways. Either someone's got to go or they actually end up being like really good friends. Because that's, that's a weird thing that happens a lot in the league where there's someone you don't like and then you get traded to the team and then you realize, oh, we're not so different, you and I. So you think the, the, the opinion was formed without knowing each other? Well, I mean, the opinion was formed because in the in the throes of competition, right, where Russell Westbrook was dribbling to the sideline, crossing half court, which is internationally known. They're going to call a timeout. You, everyone just kind of— They point. Yeah. They point to the referee when they're crossing yep. half court. They lay back, and Patrick Beverly didn't stop. And so he kind of undercut him. Westbrook gets hurt, and I think he, you know, he tears something in his knee, and— It ends up being something that is a nagging injury for him for quite a while. And so that was the birth of, like, I don't like this guy because he kind of went outside rules of engagement. Patrick Beverly's response is, well, ref hasn't whistled, so I'm going to play through the whistle. Also, I guess, I can't remember whether it was earlier in the series or, or earlier in the season for him, someone had did the thing where they point and then they didn't call the timeout. They turned the corner and got to the basket. So Patrick Beverly's like, well, I can't. Isn't that the quarterback when they when they think they're going to spike the ball, yeah. stop the clock, and then they fake the spike and throw oh, a touchdown pass? One of my, Should you be upset at that? One of my favorite plays ever got pulled back. It was, uh, you remember this, Peyton Manning, when he was with the Colts? So they're in the formation, and he stands up, and he looks at the sideline and says, what? I can't hear I can't hear you. And while he's doing this, they hike it and, like, uh, direct snap to the uh, to the running back, and he runs it for a first down. And I can't remember why they pulled it back, but I was like, oh, that sucks because that's such a beautiful play. What, you mean it was like a holding penalty? It was, it was or an some, illegal procedure? It, they didn't do it because he touched his ears no, and tried to fool no, him? No, no, it was something Just else. a penalty. Yeah, it was a penalty. They called it back. But yeah. that I'm talking about that's sportsmanlike. That's not bad. When you try to t- get advantage the, over your opponent, the hidden ball trick, we practice the hidden ball trick oh, in yeah? spring training, right? You want to have that in your quiver just in case that you know of a player who doesn't pay attention. Right. Mike, Mike Lowell pull, pulled it off once for you he guys, did. right? He did, successfully. It happens more often than you think. It's tried way more often than you see on TV. Really? Yes. Yeah, because I, I've been watching some baseball and gambling again, and uh, <laughs> I have, I've have i been longing for the days of the hidden ball trick. Oh, it still goes on. It's just you only see when it's successful. Nice. How does it work? Uh, you Let's say the ball is thrown to first base. The first baseman pretends to throw it back to the pitcher but right. doesn't. And right. then the guy takes a lead off first base and gets tagged. Or it happens the same on second base. Right. When the ball comes to the cutoff man, you then throw it back to the infielder. And then still the outfielder has the ball. The second base runner goes off and the outfielder sort of comes up and tags him out. But is there a code? Is it? Would it be it's considered... Bush League, if someone tried doing that in the playoffs, let's say a, an out was decided in the World Series game via the, the hidden ball trick, would that be considered Bush League? Yeah, we've actually talked about that. No. So you're trying to get 27 outs no matter how. And, and in basketball, you're trying to score as many baskets right. as you can. In football, you're trying to score as many points. So I disagree completely with anyone being upset. If Russ Westbrook is pissed off, that's on him. Well, you are supposed he got to, hurt. That's, but that's on him. He got hurt, right? I mean, right. it happens. I mean, he it wasn't a cheap shot by Pat Bev, was it? Did he go for his knees? Did he dive at his knees? It was, yeah, There's he was always a, a tinge of that with uh, Pat yeah. Bev. Yeah, he's, he's kind of a little bit of a loose cannon. Is he a Draymond Green type of guy? No, no. Draymond Green has a lot more... Like, polish? Polish and also judiciousness in what he's doing. And Patrick Beverly is just... So you view him as out of control? Yeah. Where Draymond, his... What about Dennis Rodman? Was he out oh, of control? No, no. He was... That was... Master class of someone of who was in control of in control Agreed. and purposefully doing things to psychologically disrupt his opponent. I I agree. I mean, like like uh, Tom uh, Tomlinson, the guy who whis- who whispered in uh, in his ear, what, uh, Stevenson. Oh, oh God, Lance, what's Stevenson, Lance, Lance Stevenson, Stevenson, right? Yeah. I'm in for all that. So yeah. you're saying Beverly's different than that. So if that's true, I'm not sure he and Westbrook will become friends then. Yeah, I mean, I there's there's also a part where I don't think Beverly has the the self awareness. To understand, okay, how can I repair this relationship now that you know now that we'll be teammates? He's, you think LeBron takes part of that? 
I do. I mean, probably. LeBron was aware of this trade is happening. Oh, yeah. Aware right. of the history they, with Westbrook. running everything by him. I think one of the funny things was, uh, what's it, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, THT was an untouchable. And now he gets traded for Patrick. Nobody's Beverly. untouchable. No, but that was- No, that but was, they, were, they were trying to inflate that trade chip. It, they don't yeah. have very many trade they, chips there. They had, they had an opportunity to get Kyle Lowry. Before Kyle Lowry came to Miami, when he was in Toronto at the trade deadline, and Toronto's like, well, we want Taylor Horton Tucker, and the Lakers said, no, absolutely not. And then about a year and a half later, they trade him for for a guy that— It know, happens, right? I mean, but but this, people this go does from untouchable them, to right? available. This is, this is a decent move, no? I think it's so marginal, and THT had a bad year. That I mean, like, he had a bad year, but he had a really good year the year before that. He's so young— that I would have just rather just said, well, maybe this he'll bounce back this year rather than give up on him for a guy who's past his expiration date. And again, I feel like does it, it lacks the self awareness that you need in order to kind of escalate. Desperate teams trade on the high, right? So I did that way too many times where we would trade a player at the exact wrong time, right? I should have said desperate desperate teams trade on the low, meaning yeah. you you're doing it at a time when you're not getting the value back that right. you should get for that player, but you're doing it because you're concerned that he won't rebound and it's just a very bad plan. We always talk about you can't fall in love with your own bullshit, right? You 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 walk around, you can bullshit people on so and so like, "Oh, THT, no, we would never trade him. Oh, he's too good." But you also have to understand He's not that good. You have to know him better than anyone else. So he's not that good. If a deal like this comes around, this is why you get young players and develop them. You, I, it always boggles my mind. Like when there's, okay, Bradley Beal was a guy that was talked about to be on on the move, and um, I think it was here we're talking about would you throw Tyler Hero into a Bradley Beal deal? And I said no, I would never. And I'm like, if Tyler Hero ever became as good as Bradley Beal, you would be head over heels. So why not go get the real bad Bradley Beal? Why are you, why are you hoping he might turn out that way? Is, isn't it just the the cost control, cheaper salary elements of I, it? Like if you have him at ten million, it's supposed to him at forty million. You're assuming the money's even when you're saying what you're saying. I, I'm assuming that a fan should not care what Mickey Harrison spends on the team. A fan should care that of the the best possible but, 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 product I, I, but on the field. Fans realize now. But shouldn't now. a fan care about how they allocate their salary cap dollars? Because when well, you aren't spending on Bradley Beal, you could be spending on another really good player that helps your team. If the value between it's, Hero and Beal is roughly correct. the same, yeah. Tyler Hero but, plus but thirty million has sports. to be better than but, Beal. But let's not get something confused. I'm not saying that Bradley Beal and, and Tyler Hero are even. I'm saying that. Bradley Beal is miles better than Tyler Hero. Your hope is that one day Tyler Hero, if everything breaks right, he might be as almost as good as Bradley Beal. Or we can go get the real Bradley Beal right now. We would keep a list, by the way. But of, you can't get the real Bradley Beal right now because of the cap situation. Well, no, no, that was talking about. Yeah, like I two understand, years but we were talking for, but we were talking about vacuum. with a team that had just won the Eastern Conference, right? And and you're already projecting a, a then rookie Tyler Hero. You understand where his contract is. You understand where your what your books look like. Right. You don't really have the money to add a Bradley Beal without giving up Tyler Hero and a substantial damn your max player on top of that. It's really like, bam. I think what me. he was more talking about, which is in interesting, is people who we had two sets of books, mm -hmm. and I don't mean financial books, and I don't mean medical <laughs> records. <Clear> that up. <laughs> I'm saying that we would have lists of players who we would promote to national writers and to the people who make the list of prospects mm -hmm. and f rank the farm systems, and we'd have a list where we're going out and saying – we're going to pump up these 20 guys because they're not our guys. Right. We're on, they're in our system. Yeah. We don't really love them, but we want to trade them, and we want other teams and other owners to look and say, oh, my God, they think Tyler Hero is going to be Bradley Bill. Right. Well, and that's that's what kind of felt like what was going on with uh, THT a little bit. Like, they really inflated no, that. I think they be they believed. You they, think so? They believed. I mean, the, the media over there bought it hook, line, and sinker. They he, were really touting him. They believed because he, he was – he, remember, he was 18 when he got drafted. He was re really young, uh, which is a rarity in in the NBA because the rule is you have to be 19 in the calendar year of your draft to be eligible. So he's he's got like a December birthday. So as an 18-year-old, it was like, this guy, he can't. he's not even old enough to drink, and he's already making an impact and he, on a championship team. So the idea was, whoa, the, the, you know, they did it again. They found a guy in the second round who was kind of undervalued, and now he's gone up and— 
uh, we've got we've got an opportunity to see some real growth. And I, my thing was like, I don't. Th- I mean, he's a good player. He's not good enough to say, no, no, don't give me a guy like Kyle Lowry who can legitimately make a difference. There's an argument that if they had traded for Kyle Lowry, they wouldn't have made the Westbrook trade. You know, uh, or yeah, six months later or three months later. I thought and, the Westbrook trade was just because LeBron wanted him to, well, as a play as a playmate, well, or was well, that I, Carmelo I, Anthony? I wanted to bring up that aspect of this with this trade as well. Because the Lakers, is this the last young player that they've cashed in now? They don't have, other than if you consider Anthony Davis a young player, this is basically the last one that they've cashed in. This is the residual effect of having LeBron James on your team. He doesn't want to go through the up and downs of having Taylor Horton Tucker, having an up and down for good first year, bad second season. Maybe he can rebound and get better in year three with with, with a new coach. But like LeBron eventually saps your team of all young players and draft pick assets and then at the end, you have to rebuild. It's why the vampire. When, it's why whenever he talks about like the Heat's develop, oh look at all these guys that are you know d- develop for the Heat. That could never happen if LeBron was on your team. 